Got it. Cool. Hi, everyone. Ciao. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, here with my very good friend, Cliff, um, who I was fortunate to, enough to catch up with at the, uh, the Houston conference um, for helium in December. And uh, a lot has happened in the helium market. And so instead of hearing from me all the time, I thought it'd be good to bring one of the world's experts in. So Cliff, maybe give everyone a little bit of a background as to who you are and, uh, and what you do in the helium world, and then we can dive into it. All right, thanks, Stefan. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. Hello, all. I'm, uh, my name is Cliff Kane. I'm president of the Edelgas Group. Uh, I own a firm uh, that we, that specializes in helium and hydrogen and atmospheric gases uh, in the industrial gas markets. Um, you know, we you know we have end users, uh, distributors uh, the, as our clients. Uh, we help them everything from uh, contract negotiations to drawing up contracts, offtake agreements, uh, even exploratory and production. You know, I've been doing this for about three years now on my own. Uh, I did come over from uh, the industrial gas majors at one time. So thanks. Good. All right. So, um, so let's, let's dive into it. Obviously, three, three major topics that, uh, that we should probably try and cover um, is the, the first one. The first one, arguably one of the most interesting ones, is, uh, is Russia and the AMO project. Um, right. but then also, it would be great to touch on the BLM and their challenges. And now, obviously, today, um, yeah, we also have the, the Qatar challenges. And all three of those are probably the, the, the three giants in the room in terms of production. So, uh, so let's, let's start with a little bit of the Amur project. What can, you tell us, uh, what can you tell us about the trains that have gone down, which uh, now slowly, slowly, we're starting to peel back exactly what's taken place? Well, you know, I would say 60 days ago, uh, there was a lot of hope uh, in the industry that uh, there was going to be some maybe some balance uh, uh, brought to the market uh, from uh, Morris Helium. But, you know, unfortunately, they've suffered uh, two incidences. You know, the first one, they had a couple fires which uh, engulfed uh, first and second trains. Um, and then just this fire recently wasn't really a fire, it was an explosion. Right. So, um, you know, three out of the four trains are down. Uh, there's concern that the fourth train, if they even, you know, ramped it up to turn it on, it's probably going to suffer the same fate as the first three. Uh, you know, we're looking, you know, easily uh, 12 months or even longer uh, for that project to even start producing anything like it, that was promised before. Um, and just to be clear, know, I mean, even, even if it does come on in 12 months time, we're not talking about all four trains coming on. And then there's still another four trains after that. We're talking about maybe bringing limp mode in. Is, is that that's fair? correct that that's fair i mean if you're anticipating as an end user or distributor of uh you know russian or more helium uh coming into the market um we need to go ahead and just kick that down the road for another year and a half uh, before we even start seeing any more helium coming out of that plant it's just not going to happen all right so now let's maybe talk about uh about the other elephant in the room around Amur. um Obviously, location, location, location. The first thing being is that Amur is just very far away from anything, and you've got monsoon rains in 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 uh, spring and autumn, but then you've got Siberian winters, and you're driving this stuff by truck. And then ultimately, where are you driving it to? I mean that that was that was a fascinating discovery when when I saw it for the first time. Right. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. I just kind of want to let the viewers know, uh, just kind of give them an idea where, where the actual gas processing plant is uh, and then where the helium hub is and you know, kind of how this all works. Just bear with me here. Let's see here. This is for everybody. Uh, all right, let's just share screen again. There we go. Perfect. All right, now do you see it? There we go. All right, guys. So as you can see here, uh, you know, this more GPP product uh, project, uh, let me zoom up here in the town of Sabodny. Uh, here's the plant. So here's, you know, kind of the first phase completion that, you know, was has been touted, uh, you know, for the past year that was going to be up and running. Um, here you have your four trains, uh, you know, down here and, you know, three of, the, of these four are going to be are down, right? Uh, then you got to look at the distance traveled. Now this road road is really pretty much all paved. I mean, at, at one time and still to this day, uh, this was kind of a heavily militar, militarized region uh, during the Soviet era and even during the current you know 
Russian Federation uh, time period here. And that helium would have to be, is transported by truck or would have been transported by truck all the way down to here. And this is about a three day minimum drive um, in, in good weather, in yeah. good conditions. Uh, down to the helium hub, which on this uh, Google uh, Earth image, it's not showing, uh, but there is updated foot. And that's, that's because the helium hub is next door to what specifically? Uh, so Russia in conjunction had built one of the largest uh, global data collection centers right next door, you know, which obviously would use helium for its servers uh, to keep things cool, right? Uh, so it's, you know, a lot going on in this little uh, pocket here. Um, the helium hub was, was built right here. I do have, so I do have one picture, I think, that I can show. Um, it's going to show here. Yeah, I don't think it's going to show. But just to give the, the viewers an idea of where this actual helium hub is located, I kind of zoom out a little bit here. Uh, the port of Vladivostok is right here. Uh, again, this is the uh, you know heart of the Russian uh, Pacific Navy, right? Uh, this is you know very heavily uh, militarized as far as different naval stations located around Amur Bay. I know there's been concerns, you know, folks have been saying that these bridges have been out and this is one of the reasons why the storage, you know, the ISO containers can't get out of the port. You know, that's not really true. Uh, you know, you've got uh, Zolotoy Bridge right here, uh, which is kind of a recent build, 2012. Uh, it's just fine. Uh, this is not preventing any traffic uh, from coming in and out of the port, which you can see here, just to kind of confirm to show you the maritime traffic. And as you can see, traffic is flowing just fine. Yeah. On the eastern side of the bay, uh, the other bridge that is, that everybody's talking about the Rusty Bridge. Um, it also is just fine. Uh, had it had some issues, yes. But for all intents and purposes, it's not preventing any, any commercial traffic from flowing in and out of the actual harbor. So some of the concerns are there, you know, they're saying, well, why is it all being held up here? Uh, well, this goes back to the current you know, geopolitical situation right now with uh, what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, you know, Russia, you know, Vladivostok was a closed city from 1958 till 1991. Uh, the Russians are still very sensitive to kind of, uh, you know, the eyes and ears coming in and out of this, out of this port town. Um, again, your the helium hub is right in here right next to the largest uh, global data center uh, that Russia's pretty much built. So if, if there's any concerns or you know rumors out there of why that's closed down, it, it's not because of the bridges, um, I will tell you that. And what we have seen is we actually have seen commercial traffic shifting over to Nahadka Bay. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting development there. You know, why is, uh, you know, one of Vostok starting to cut back traffic and moving it over here. But for our conversation, as far as helium, that doesn't really matter anymore uh, because there's going to be no really helium coming out of this port uh, for at least, you know, 12 to 18 months. And right now, my understanding is that there's actually quite a backlog of, of trailers sitting here lying idle, which is putting additional pressure on the actual movement of helium from operating plants. Is that fair? Can you repeat that again, Stefano? That as it stands right now, there are a lot of idle trailers sitting over here that aren't being filled up, which which just reduces the amount of available capacity to move helium from other plants. Right, that's correct. I mean, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of ISO containers were uh, stacked here uh, in, in preparation for bringing that helium out to the market. Um, they are now stuck there. Um, I know that. They're trying, you know, you know, the major tier ones are trying to get their uh, their ISO containers out. Um, they are running into difficulty doing that. Um, you know, there has been some conversations of maybe moving that overland uh, back to Europe, but that in itself would get really costly, as you can tell. Uh, they only have really one option at the moment, and that's really they're going to have to get it out of the port. Otherwise, you've got yourself. 
even if by road, right, if, if you drove it by truck, just to even get it to, to the Ukraine or Belarus. And obviously, we're not trying to go through the eastern Ukraine at the moment. Um, let's just say Germany, right, or Poland to get those ISOs out. You know, you're talking 12 to 14 days minimum uh, to get those out in good conditions. And right now, we're they're in a winter uh, mode right now. So, okay. All right. So that's Russia. Let's, uh, let's move on to the BLM. So my understanding on the BLM is that uh, it was just a little bit more than some health and safety concerns. That's the Strategic Reserve in Amarillo in Texas having failures of right. compressors and its electrical systems. So this isn't going to get fixed anytime soon. No, unfortunately, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to the team that is down there in Amarillo. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, they're basically working with Band-Aids, right? Um, U.S. government really is not pouring any more money into that. Uh, into that facility other than to just basically keep it <laughs> barely alive until the sale in September of this year. Um, you know, you have everything from anomalous electrical issues to uh, gas leaking, um, you know, water coating issues uh, that have been going on for the past couple of years, compressors that are down, uh, or they're in a constant state of repair and going down. Uh, so, you know, you know, in my opinion, you know, going forward up until September, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think the BLM is just going to continue to be down. And even if they do come up, they're going to have issues. And I think I got a note this morning that the pipeline pressure dropped about another 100 PSI uh, to 600 PSI. So even in the pipeline, you know, the heliums, it, it's just not coming out. So uh, you're, you're looking at 10% of the world supply uh, just out of that facility alone that, that's off the market. You know, so we have the anticipation of Russian helium coming on the market, which is not there. We're at pre-pandemic level demand, and the BLM is down. Uh, Cutter Gas, they can't push out any more helium at this moment, uh, or LNG. Uh, so we're, we're hurtling right back to the time that we had before, before the pandemic, and that was uh, you know, a period of uh, consistent allocations and shortages. I mean, helium crisis 3.0 has been ongoing since pretty much 2019. So this is this is with these three because it always happens in threes, right? This is now helium right. crisis 3.0 squared. Um, and just to explain, I mean, the, so the, the backdrop to Qatar for for those of you that that weren't in the know, in the know, Qatar was meant to come online with an additional plant in 2017, and based on on comments that they made today. It looks like that plant isn't, they're not anticipating it coming online until 2025. So all current forecasts for production are also out of the window. Um, right. So, uh, you know, everything that was projected as soon, you know, as early as 90 days ago, right, is, is now going to be, it's going to be off completely. Um, so, you know, all the end users that had forecasted growth. Uh, because they were anticipating the, the helium going to be in the market, uh, they're going to have to revise all that. All right. So let's uh, let's take the conversation forward and what this means in terms of the recent uh, the recent upstream auction. And just bearing in mind that there's upstream auction and there's downstream price, and the two are distinctly different. The one has the impact on the other. Let's talk upstream at the refinery first. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's no secret that. The refineries have been selling at somewhere between 220, 250, as much as 300 in times of crisis. What's happening at the refinery level at the moment? Well, it's just the increased demand, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're at max capacity. Uh, you know, Exxon Mobil is coming off of a, a record year uh, at the Wyoming facility. Um, and it, it looks like this year they're going to have another record hit. So, um, you know, obviously that's going to drive pricing up, right? And, uh, you know, any of any of the spot load uh, market that is available, which that's going to dry up pretty quickly, um, you know, that all that does is just drive the pricing up. And, and then you just have the snowball effect, you know, going downhill, right? Um, you, know, you know, you know, when you look at, you know, your tier one distributors, right, picking up at, you know, original prices of 250, 300, right? You know, that's per, you know, per thousand uh, cubic feet, right, per M. Um, when you look at the, the end user, retail user, right, your cylinders, your doers, especially in times of allocation, you know, they can be paying, you know, easily $500 per 300 standard cubic feet, you know, and that's just one cylinder. 
So yeah. that's, like, that's uh, what is that? About $1,800. It works out to about $1,800 per MCF. That's just ludicrous. Right. That's ludicrous. And that's, the, so uh, you, you'd recently penned an article where you were talking about the refineries at a, between 400 and 450 per MCF. Right. It actually, that, those numbers came as a shock to us at first because we were anticipating that, you know, if, if the Russian helium was going to be coming into the market, right, uh, there's there's been talk and some consensus among the consultants in the world, right, that uh, Russia was really going to come out in with some really low pricing that wouldn't really make sense, right? Um, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, ExxonMobil and, uh, you know, Cutter Gas saw that as a really big threat to their market share. Um, you know, hence why you see ExxonMobil, you know, starting up the gas direct program, uh, looking maybe to go more toward end users. Uh, uh, again, they were fully anticipating it to come online. Uh, you know, no love lost between those two and, and Gazprom, right? But um, so no, yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, it's always the it's always the end customer that's going to suffer in this equation. Right. And you also got to remember the power equation to this, right? Uh, you know, the, these, these helium liquefiers, right, they, they require a lot of power, right? So anytime you have utility costs going up, I mean, that also has a pretty big effect, um, you know, to the cost of production of that helium in itself. So now I'm going to I'm going to ask you um, also, let's try and keep this. Uh, I think we've covered a broad, a broad array here. Uh, so probably bring it to an end. But just before we bring it to an end, there is one, there is a term that you used the other day, which I thought was absolutely genius. <laughs> you just relay it again and explain it in layman's terms, because it is probably one of the most poignant terms about the helium industry. Well, you know, as much as I would like to take credit for it, I can't, I, I didn't coin that term, but, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, give credit to one of my good friends and colleagues, Greg Peters, uh, with Disruptive Resources. Uh, you know, I worked with him in the past at Praxair. Um, but, you know, helium is a, it's, it's a critical path product, right? This is not something that, you know, when, when you look at a semiconductor, you know, manufacturer in a plant, right? They're, they're investing 20, 30, 40 billion dollars into these complexes, right? Uh, that take years to build. Um, if, if, you know, they need new windows or doors, I mean, listen, that, that, is, that is easy stuff. That's not going to have any impact to their production whatsoever. Uh, but when you take helium out of the, out of the equation, right, and, and they don't have their helium, you know, these, these companies can lose millions of dollars a day uh, with, by not having helium. Um, this is where, when we talk about uh, pricing becomes secondary to supply, that's the real thing. Um, you've got companies out there right now that will pay double or triple the market price in today's prices just to make sure they have the helium. And now that's a whole other conversation we can talk about because again, a lot of these customers are locked in the contracts that are, that are very stringent, right? They just can't go shop around when they want to, right? Uh, and even in times of allocation, the, you know, there's only very few players in, 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 this, in this market, right? So they can't just up and go look for more helium elsewhere. It just, it's just not there. And this is why I say it's so critical uh, for all the explorers out there, uh, all the new independent producers uh, that, are, that are really trying to bring new supply online. I, I applaud you uh, because it is needed. It really is needed. Well, listen, I, uh, I've learned a few things today. Thank you. I hope, uh, hope everyone watching this found it interesting. Um, and you know, to your point, uh, it, it sounds like there's probably another, another session in here somewhere. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we will post this, uh, we'll post this on Twitter and LinkedIn. And yeah, if you, uh, if you want to start following Cliff, he, uh, he puts out these, these perlas and these nuggets and, and it's, it's really worthwhile. There's a, there's a lot of really valuable information that, uh, that comes out of it. So Cliff, listen, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, let's do this again. Absolutely, Stefano. Hey, thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks a lot.